Today's show is brought to you by Ring, Stitch Fix, Third Love, and Quip. On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family through their Facebook page, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. I'm Tim, here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? Doing pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good about episode 90. Yeah, it's very good. And actually, we've we've really wanted to have dog experts on for the longest time. So we finally get that opportunity in speaking with Deb Ash and Travis Day. These are the two individuals who helped us out when we went to New Hampshire. They brought their cadaver dog, Eisen, and the cadaver dog searched numerous properties up there that have been in question uh, regarding Moore's disappearance. Amazing dog, Eisen. It's uh, Deb's dog, and uh, she was on the Oxygen show um, with Maggie Freeling, Oxygen's uh, The Disappearance of Maura Murray, if you haven't seen it. It's very good. Please check it out. Um, so you can see a little bit of Eisen and the work that these dogs do, and they're downright incredible, Lance. And so aren't the trainers. Deb and Travis were amazing amazing handlers and they were amazing people to work with and the information that we have coming up in this episode it, it's so detailed because uh deb approaches it with a very scientific eye she basically says I, I love her analogy of um the scent that the dog gets is like spraying perfume into the air into a room and then at some point it dissipates so you have to understand that this is uh this is an actual scent like we would smell perfume yeah, there's a lot to learn there um, from these search dogs and, and from Deb and Travis that we never had any idea about all these uh, parameters uh, regarding scent and how scent works. And I know it sounds weird because we just have noses and we smell, but it, there's a lot more to it. Yeah, and I got to say, this is a great example of the way this community comes together and they arrange for search dogs to go up there and, and check out these areas. There's the Boots on the Ground gr community, the Boots on the Ground group that had booked Deb as well on the same day. And instead of the situation turning into something negative, we all just made it a positive. And we worked with Barbara up there and she said, you know, we're all here for the same purpose. And if you guys are going to search over here and we're going to search over there, we'll just figure out the time to do it. And Deb and Travis were incredibly accommodating. And uh, it's just a really good example of how things can come together if you just listen to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Some communication is very important, and uh, and it's great. So thank you very much to Deb and Travis for uh, for working with us and for uh, for doing this interview with us. It's really, uh, I think, a lot of good information came about because of it. Yeah, and thanks to the boots on the ground people and to Barbara up there, who you know we just looked at the situation and, and moved forward. Okay, so we just wanted to recap a couple of emails before we get to Deb and Travis. And uh, some of the YouTube comments from our last episode, episode 89, Search Rundown with Maggie Freeling. There's a few comments about Butch Atwood and not dismissing Butch Atwood as a potential suspect. How do you feel about that, Lance? 
I think not dismissing Butch Atwood if you're just getting started in this mystery is something that's very reasonable, but definitely go through the work and the due diligence to look at all of the factors that go into Butch's involvement in the case, and I think eventually you will dismiss him, but... You know, if you're just starting off in this, you have to look at him and don't dismiss him right away. Don't dismiss anybody right away. We got an email from Jack. He says, guys, you continue to perpetuate the myth that there is a 48 hour waiting time before a person can be reported missing. Jack says he was in law enforcement for over 30 years and there has never been that policy. Okay, now we know. Okay, thank you, Jack. That is interesting to know. We appreciate uh, the email. Here's a comment from Kristen on YouTube. She asks us to start a podcast on Brandon Lawson. And uh, be, and I think that's because we uh, we just did a feed drop, Lance, where we um, we put one of our Crawl Space episodes into the Missing Maura Murray feed, and it was the episode called Missing Brandon Lawson. And so we got a, little, a, lo- a lot of emails back about that, about the, the 911 call and about that case. Based on the reaction of that episode, we're definitely going to be doing more episodes about Brandon's case. It is something that is uh, as mysterious as Moore's case, and it's something that a lot of people, there's a big community just like Moore's case. So I think we now have a responsibility to follow up on that. We have a good relationship with Jason Watts, and we can see how much more information we can get from the family, friends, and maybe law enforcement. So I'm, I'm down to do a few more episodes on that. And we got a cool email from Dude Man Productions who uh, who wrote a song or at least some music to Kurt Murray's lyrics to the song that he wrote where uh, where he talks to Maggie Freeling on the disappearance of Maura Murray Oxygen Show. So I think that w- that was really nice. We uh, have to make sure it's cool with Curtis and uh, and old Dude Man to, uh, to play it or play a little bit on the air. But I think that's something we could do in a future episode. And continue to do things like that for the listeners out there. If you have this energy to put into the case and you want to do something creative and you want to provide something, we we really enjoy things like that. So keep this coming and it's a good use of your energy. Tammy on YouTube says, I knew before it even happened that this GoFundMe thing would be a bad idea. If you guys want to do a podcast, that's one thing. But taking on amateur forensics is completely different matter and should be left to the experts. She goes on and on. Um, I can't disagree with you more about that, Tammy. It's been nothing but a good idea and a good thing for the community and the case. I mean, if you want to criticize something, we need to have the backup to the criticism. And right now, everything that's been going on with the GoFundMe has been incredibly productive. And I would just please insist that people understand money spent to get something back as a result and that result is not a definite answer is not a failure for example gpr scanning that shows nothing under the surface or shows something and digging is done and nothing is found that is not a non-answer that means that that can now be crossed off the list so that is productive so just don't get frustrated with any lack of you know the smoking gun yeah, because there probably isn't going to be a smoking gun found at this point. We're fifteen, almost 15 years later. so Right, and everybody who donated to the GoFundMe did it voluntarily. Leah wrote in, she's got a couple questions about dogs. Did you search where they got a hit years ago off of Old Peter's Road? I remember there being a hit in the woods behind Four Seasons Old House and Old Peter's Road. The police dug there but found nothing, so they suspect RF hid the body there over winter and later moved her don't know we weren't with the dogs when they searched uh, old peter's road so that didn't happen on our watch we do know that there was probably a couple locations that they were not granted access to deb goes out of her way to say that she will not search a location that she does not have access to or permission to search so those areas on old peter's road anywhere to the left or right you do border people's properties and you can't just send a dog in there as we found as we you know we, we asked deb i mean you could if you want but there's if you were to find something then there's it's completely inadmissible because That's you right. did not get permission to do so uh so if there was a hit way back and they dug and they didn't find anything then i would say that that hit should be dismissed Leah goes on to say if the dogs got a hit in his old trailer, would that scent only be contained in the trailer or would it penetrate into the ground around where the trailer was placed? And I think that's a really good question. I wish we asked Deb that. 
Well, we sort of did ask Deb that question, and we can hear her answer because we got into how long it would take before a scent would disappear. And she says, well, that's when she used the perfume example, or right around that time she used a perfume example. Basically, it, after a certain amount of time, any scent will disappear. And if you take a body out, then you just you you just expedite that scent disappearing. So... But it is like a wall. It is like a switch, she said. Once they do smell it, they it's unmistakable. Okay, so uh, let's play the interview with Deb and Travis. Thank you, everybody, for listening and writing in. Please keep the emails and correspondence coming. We're available at missingmoramurray at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at Doc. We're on Instagram and Facebook at missingmoramurray. Check out Finding Mora Murray on Prime Video. And just to reiterate, 10% of that download cost goes to the GoFundMe campaign for Mora, and that is to fund anything from billboards to searches, GPR, cadaver dogs, search dogs, etc. And we appreciate every penny that is put into that account, and we will do our best to make the most productive use out of it. Welcome to Missing Mora Murray, Deb Ash and Travis Day. How are you today? Doing well. Doing very well, thank you. Great. Now, uh, we met you both a few weeks back uh, up in New Hampshire. And uh, Deb, can you tell us what it is that you do? I'm uh, an advanced certified cadaver dog handler. So I work a dog to find missing and lost people that have passed away. Excellent. And Travis, can you tell us how this arrangement came to be and where, how you uh, come into the fold here as well? <laughs> so I kind of came in because I uh, emailed you guys with a few questions about some things I had in the podcast. And in talking to you guys, I mentioned that you know I had a little bit of experience working with people with search dogs and things such as that. And uh, it kind of went from there where I grew up, my grandmother bred and trained search dogs, and that's how I met Deb years and years ago. Um, and that's kind of how I came into all of this. Very good. And uh, Deb, you were on the Oxygen Show, right, with uh, Eisen? Correct. Both with Eisen and also with his half-brother, Angus, and Heather Schaefer, who did the recreation of the, the reenactment of the, um, the road section. Right. Okay, so, um, and... What is what is Angus and Eisen do? Are are they different kind of search dogs? Both of them are cadaver dogs, and Angus and Eisen is in the cadaver aspect. They do it exactly the same way, which is air scenting. But Angus is also a live was a live find tracking dog, so he's able to track people that are alive, their footstep to footstep, and then when they disappear, I mean, obviously the scent disappears which is what happened in the recreation. Okay, so they actually gave um, Eisen and Angus uh, a scent from Mora for the, for the TV show? No. So with the cadaver odor, it's, um, it becomes gen- you become generic once you pass away. So um, the cadaver odor was supplied, and... Um, Eisen did his portion of it, the land portion, where the big search was done for Mora into the woods and so on and so forth, and showed how that worked. And then the supposition is is that from her car, she walked down the road and was subsequently picked up by another car, and we recreated that. So... A young lady got into, she drove her car, parked it where Mara's car was. She got out of that car. She walked down the road and then someone came along and picked her up. And then Heather took Angus and started him at the car, gave Angus a scent article of that young lady, and then proceeded to track her to where she then got into the car and the scent was then lost. And that's what you see in the um, Oxygen Network video, where he's tracking along. You can see him trailing, going along the edge of the road, and then all of a sudden his head pops up and he downs. It's like there's no more scent. That's called popping a negative. Okay, that's 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 really cool. Um, 
So they're very exact. They're very specific with uh, when scents disappear. Uh, I guess my, my question is, the scent disappears right where the dog sits down, correct? Not like around the area, right where the dog will sit down. In this instance, there is no more scent around the area. I so see. So if there's no more scent around, there's nothing to create a scent pool. So he's following the scent cone. He's following the scent. It's along the edges of the road. And then all of a sudden, the, the source of the scent disappears. So therefore, the scent disappears with it. It's like shutting off a light switch. Okay. No, that's a really good, uh, good analogy on that because uh, I think... I, I personally had a misconception, and I want to clear up the misconception, that if it's a cadaver dog or a search dog and they lose the scent, then it's sort of a general area. Then it's like we, we have a, an area of, for example, to use a round number of 50 feet. But it's not the case. It's more like a switch. Ah, in the instance of when it comes to working a vehicle, it typically is just like a switch. All of a sudden... It's like it's like you dribbling something on the ground and you go dribble, 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 and then you pick the cup up and it stops. When she climbed into the car, the scent was contained and it and it went and the scent source has been taken away. When it comes to searching for someone that's out in the landscape or is buried somewhere or is somebody, you know, is out lost, your that scent generator is still generating scent. And this, the, the wind is picking it up and moving it around. So you're going to get pieces of it as you work through the landscape. That doesn't disappear because your scent source has not disappeared. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Does that make sense? I think so. Yep. How long does that maintain out there? How long does that maintain in the atmosphere? As long as the scent source is there. Okay. Okay. I, you understand. So if you're out there for five days, you're generating a lot of scent over five days. Okay. Once you leave and you go somewhere else, that scent dissipates fairly quickly because it's being moved around by wind and water and whatever's out in the environment. You take that, that scent, it's like having, having a perfume bottle and you take the lid off the perfume bottle and when you walk in the room, you can smell it. All right. But when you remove that perfume bottle and then you leave it for a little bit, and you walk back into the room, the scent starts to dissipate and get lighter and fainter. And eventually after 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever, it completely disappears because the scent source has left. Mm hmm. Do okay. you understand? Yeah, that's a great description. Yeah, we, we work well with uh, visuals visuals that, and metaphors. That so works. The, the yeah. perfume <laughs> bottle definitely helps out. Um, <laughs> when Tim leaves the room, it's at least four days before his scent is completely gone. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so then, in your opinion, based on the work that you've done, is did Mora get into a car? Is that what? Is that kind of what what uh what you're saying based on the um recreation okay so we were asked to recreate if that was the case all right which is what we did what i know about the cave and what they did initially when she went missing they searched quite extensively for a number of days around that area and you have to remember we had fresh snowfall it's not like it was in August where you can walk into the woods and kind of disappear and not leave a trace as to where you walked into the woods. We had snowfall. There, there were no footprints. There, were, there was nothing for the searchers to go by when they first started going out and looking for her. There was no indication that she walked off the, the road itself. So the supposition is or was that perhaps she got, someone picked her up, that she walked a certain distance. And from what I understand is police tracking dogs within 24 hours of her going missing tracked her from her car down the road for 150 yards and then nothing. So just that in and of itself leads me to believe that she could very well have gotten into a car and been taken somewhere. Okay. Now, 
that from your understanding, if she were to have gone onto one of the properties and they couldn't have brought the dogs on there, it would, the, would the dogs have behaved the same way or, or did the scent trail just end right there? Okay. So if someone had picked her up and then moved her to any one of the other properties, that scent trail at that time would have ended right there. I know that there have been several occasions where other cadaver dogs have come up over the years and worked some of those areas. And I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think any, any of them ever hit on anything. So if she was at one of the other properties and buried or um, in a cellar hole or in a well, you would have the scent of that in the atmosphere that the dogs would hit on because your scent source is there. It all goes back to the scent source. If the scent source is there, be it buried in a well, um, in a cave, it, it's going to come out and the dogs are going to hit on that. But from what I understand, there's been no interest in any of the areas, any of the building areas, or even um, land areas that we were asked, or that other people have been asked to search, the cadaver dogs haven't hit on anything. Okay, well, speaking of those areas, you were up there with us and with the Boots on the Ground organization, and you searched uh, many areas. Let's, uh, I, there's, a, there's a couple that we, uh, well, one in particular that we probably shouldn't give the exact address uh, over or give the exact address out. But um, we went to Rick Forcier's old house. We went to the A-frame. We did a, uh, without the dogs, we went to this hunting ground area, and then we went to this other location. Were there any other places that you went with the boots on the ground that, uh, that we didn't cover right there? There were two houses we were supposed to search, but we were not given access with boots on the ground. So they did not get done. Okay. Um, otherwise... Um, I think it was pretty much, I don't think I went anywhere different than what I had you, your people follow along. Um, I think everybody was involved in every single area that, that Eisen did on that day, except for those two houses. And we weren't allowed to have access to those anyway. The people weren't home. Oh, the people weren't home. Okay. I just want to clear that right. up. Okay. It was simply because the people weren't there. Okay. Good, good. Now, let's go to the uh, the A-frame. The A-frame was the first place that you went to with Eisen, and Travis, you were there, and Tim was there. Yep. Yeah, so uh, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you and Eisen did on the A-frame property? Well, basically what we did was we just grid through the property. So at that point, you, you're hoping that if anything is going on there, it's going to be more of a clandestine grave kind of thing rather than surface because after 14 years, there's not going to be anything on the surface. He had no interest. And then the people very kindly let us into the A-frame and I went through and I like to search not having any prior information because I don't want to influence the dog in any way, shape or form. So I had no prior information. I was just set and told to, you need to search the exterior of this book, the interior of this book. And we did. And he went into every room, every closet. He showed absolutely no interest in anywhere in the A-frame, inside or out. And uh, there is a, a closet of note in the A-frame. And we walked past it and we, you, we opened the door a little bit and Eisen kind of stuck his head in there. And was maybe maybe that act maybe lasted a second or two and then left. Uh, so because of that, does that mean like I, I know the scent source wasn't there obviously at this point, but does that mean that there was never a dead person in that closet? No, that doesn't mean that. Okay. <laughs> because the thing is, it's like anything else. Everything degrades over time, and if there's something for rent what I would call forensic there, in other words, blood spots or um, some sort of um, human uh, fluid of some kind, it doesn't mean that after 14 years that it's, it, it's not going to degrade to the point where it's no longer viable. So it has no odor, all right? He showed no interest in there. 
you know, if that, if that's a place where someone stored something for a time um, after 14 years, it doesn't mean that there wasn't someone there at the time. It's just that whatever evidence was left as far as cadaver material is concerned, it was no longer viable for the dog to be able to sense it. You said that you don't uh, want to have any prior information because you don't want to influence the dog. Is that something that the dog can sort of sense out of you when you're in a location, even if you're trying to be... I, right, you're smiling. Is it, is it sort of like a like a sixth sense, like a that the dog would have that, even though you're trying to not like influence it, that somehow you are. It's your body language. Okay. It's your body language. It's as simple as that. If I know that that might be a hot spot, I can linger a little bit longer. Um, I can I can you know sort of if if you stop and stare at something. The dog's going to go, hmm, maybe there's something there. You know, if I do something like my my final response, maybe I'll get a cookie. So let's try that. It's called a false alert. You try really, really hard as a canine handler not ever to do that because you want the, the dogs. Believe me, the dogs are very odor obedient. They can't help but not react to the odor. So you're going to get some change of behavior, a button hook or a you know, uh, stopping short or something when they hit that odor. However, if there's nothing there, especially if you've been searching for a while, you got to remember this is a hide and seek game for the dog and he wants to get paid. Now he's seeking and he's working and it's like, okay, well, they read us really, really well. So if I stop or I hesitate, it's like, hmm, well, maybe there is something here. And maybe if I pop a sit, I can get a cookie. And that's the one thing as a canine handler you do not want to do. <laughs> you're, you're talking about the how specific the dog is and how obedient they are and how the scent is, you know, is connected to them. Was, is, Travis, can you explain what you did with the, was there, was there a piece of liver that, that you give the dog after? Is, so, is yeah, so test? after the A-frame. Um, so basically we use this hide where at the end of a search it's, um, a jar with holes on the top of it when you take off the lid so that the scent can come out and you hide it somewhere so that at the end of the search the dog can still find something that has the odor which they're looking for which it's partly to reinforce the behavior but also to help them have that moment of they found what they were supposed to be looking for and they got rewarded for that so that it's not forever looking for something that they never find and they never get rewarded because then they're just not going to do it or they're going to signal false because they're wanting that reinforcement. You do your job, right? And I ask you to do your job and do your job and do your job. And you've been working for a couple of years now and I haven't paid you. And uh, guess what? After a while, you're going to stop working. But if you do a job and I pay you, especially if I pay you very well, then you're going to do that job even more willingly the next time. Same for the dog. That's exactly what it is for the dog. I picture uh, now cadaver dogs like bounty hunters or something like that. That's pretty uh, <laughs> pretty interesting. <laughs> so at the A-frame, you you all went through the interior of the A-frame, the exterior of the A-frame, and I I mean I I feel like we've done a dozen episodes on saying that there were no results, but officially from the dog handlers, you can say that at this point there were no results at the A-frame. Those are negative results. I found nothing. Okay. My dog found nothing. Okay, and then and then Travis, you buried this uh, this this. Uh, what what was it exactly? No, uh, so I didn't bury it. It's we just call it a hide, but it's a jar. Like I said, with it's kind of like a shaker top on it, so that the scent can come out when you take the cover off. Um, and you place it somewhere so they still have to look for it, but it's you know you bring them through the area and they locate that and they signal saying that you know there is a cadaver here. At which point you can reward them for that. What is the thing that's inside the jar that's called the hide? Um, that was that time was a piece of um, human heart. Whoa! Wow. Okay. Yikes. All right. You, well, how else do you expect to be able to? I mean, this is what we're looking for, so we have to keep the dog with this. Is what I'm interested in. If you don't use the actual material, how do you expect the dog to be able to? Accurately located. That's fascinating. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, uh, Travis, did you get a whiff 
of that or, or a taste? <laughs> I'm used to it at this point. I grew up doing this as a kid. <laughs> so it's delicious. Oh, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then we moved on to uh, the Forcier um, property. And how did that go? I wasn't there for that, Lance, uh, but you were. Right. We were digging, unknowingly uh, digging and releasing potential odor in the ground. But uh, that, yeah, I, that, uh, that, that digging that we did was pretty uh, fruitless. We've said that there was nothing where the anomalous uh, characteristics of the earth were discovered during the GPR over the summer. So um, th- thankfully, we didn't actually unearth anything there. But uh, yeah, we the dogs came. The dog came over. Eisen came back with uh, with you guys. And sure, take it from here. How did how did it go over at Forcier's place? Understanding that I did ask where the septic system was because you gotta have to remember that is also human odor, not something we train with, but it is a factor. As he went around the far side of the house, away from the street side, where a lot of debris was from where the, I guess, the foundation had been dug out, he did have a change of behavior. In other words, all of a sudden, he started to become more focused. He had a little bit of a tail wag. It's like he started searching for something. So to me, that signals that he's hit some kind of odor, human odor. Like I explained to the gentlemen that were there, because you have the ground penetrating radar there, it would be really important to take it over the top of that foundation dirt just to rule it out because it could be something there that would have been something easy to bury somebody in. The other thing is, is it could also be sent from the septic system depending on how it flows. Um, under the under the earth, the leach field and everything else. You know, the the ground was pitched. But I don't know how much of an angle pitch it would have been to bring it back down underneath the house and over to that far side. So that was that was the area of interest that I would say is worth because you had the ground penetrating radar there to run it over the top of all that old foundation dirt just to rule it out. Right. This is a really interesting part. So we did have uh, Ed and Graham go to that section of the property. They ran the ground penetrating radar over it, but it was too uneven for them to get a very clear read. However, Graham did say, from what I can see, it looks pretty normal, but uh, we might want to maybe stick a shovel in here and dig. Now, you strongly oppose that, right? So if there's a potential hit, one probably shouldn't start digging, correct? Okay, so I guess... When I first arrived, you kind of misunderstood. If you start digging, the dog's going to show interest there. All right. If you just start digging, he goes, wow. Oh, is there something of interest there? Plus, on top of which is your human odor. I mean, what I what I need, especially with these cold cases, is I need the area to be clean of live human odor. In other words, I don't need people to go through the area because what happens is, is especially after 14 years or 20 years or whatever, the scent becomes so subtle that I need to be able to watch the dog go through a clean space and hit that that pocket of odor because the minute you walk through it, it disperses. And um, it's really important to have the dog go through that subtle odor so I can see a change of behavior rather than disturbing it first, which is what happens when you start digging. Um, Once the dog has gone through and either say, yeah, I've got, you know, there's the potential of odor here or not, then you can dig as much as you like. It doesn't bother me. But I just need that initial, I need that initial space to be clean to get the dog to go through. If you've ever seen a dog work a graveyard, it takes them a while to figure out where the largest scent pool is going to be. And when they do eventually make that decision, which sometimes can take 20, 30 minutes to make that decision, it's never near a head or footstone. It's always where we've ended up in a low-lying area, in a depression, where our body fluid has flowed and the scent has flowed with with um, the hydrology of the land. 
Okay, that makes sense visually, um, but I've never seen that personally. Um, now, you, you you mentioned this as being foundation dirt against uh, against the house. Was that that was told to you by someone or? Oh, okay, Did I you... understood that at the time when she went missing, that that house was under construction, and um, the foundation was being dug at that time, which um, I can't remember if I knew that information before or after um, I started the dog, but um, that was the only place where, and I, and when I work my dog, I start him and then I stay out of his way. So I don't advance along with him. I try to just stay back and watch. That's the only reason why I said that, you know, perhaps that I knew it was foundation dirt because someone had said to me that that house was under construction at the time that the gentleman who lived there was living in a trailer. Okay. Now, yeah, at this point, I think we've heard some kind of conflicting reports on that, whether the foundation was in place or whether it was uh, under construction still when Mora went missing. So that that's interesting. So then does that mean that th- there's no possibility or there is still a possibility that there is a body under the foundation? My dog had a change of behavior. I don't know whether it was the septic system or I don't know if it's because someone is there. If you already have the ground penetrating radar there and you have the opportunity to check it out, then yes, you should check it out and rule it out. Okay, good, good. go in with a huge excavator and excavate the entire thing and disturb people, no, you do not. You try to right. do it subtly. Right. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> right. So there's there's some, you know, uh, speculation. People's imagination might run a little bit and say that it would make a lot of sense for a house that's under construction, even if that foundation was half poured or three quarters poured, or even if it was fully poured, maybe a body could then be placed there and then more poured over it. You took the dog inside the house and had eyes and sniff around in there was there any sort of change of behavior inside of the house on the on the floors no there was not okay there was not and the other the other thing that you have to realize is if we do have a significant change of behavior what we do is we then get other dogs to run the same area and see if they have the same reaction you're not basing this on just one dog you're basing this on multiple dogs at multiple times a year I mean, I've just finished up a, not finished, we're in the middle of a, another cold case search where the dogs went in in August, had a, a very significant change of behavior. And then again, the beginning of October, where two of the dogs actually gave their final responses, again, in the same tight area. And then we just did it on Saturday again, after we've had snow and cold to rule out things like swamp gas, et cetera, et cetera. And the dogs have done exactly the same thing in exactly the same place. So to me, that's worth investigating. That's worth taking the time and making the effort and getting people in to go, okay, now we got to dig. Yeah. Okay. So we're still uh, quite a bit of ways. Yeah. We're a couple of steps back from that, but I just want to synopsize this location. Please. There was a, there was a slight change of behavior that was on the side of the house that could have been brought about by um, where the leach field runs off. There was no change in behavior when Eisen was inside the house uh, sniffing around on the floor where we heard that the current owners found like a heard like a hollow spot. We did run the GPR inside the house. There was nothing abnormal underneath that concrete other than maybe what it was uh, raised up on, what the floor was raised up on, which would explain the hollow sound. And the area that Eisen had the slight change of behavior, it might be worth going back there maybe once the ground starts thawing out to do another search with other other dogs? Is that something that you would suggest or recommend? Yes. I mean, you would need, you. it would be advisable to take, take you know, two other advanced cadaver dogs at two different times, not on the same day, and have them run. And the other thing is, is if you have access to ground penetrating radar, um, to run that over. And at that point, if there's... N- no interest and and or very 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 slight interest like Eisen had and there's nothing in the ground penetrating radar then maybe it's time to move on maybe it is the leach field okay 
Um, I, t- from my understanding, the leech field, uh, and I don't want to start a thing, but the leech field is on the complete other side of the house, and, and we knew that from the ground penetrating radar. Uh, so that would be the the complete opposite side, uh, as far as we're aware. Now, w- what if there was a body under the foundation? Can dogs smell through concrete? Or there's is there a feet uh, distance that dogs can smell up until? So far, no, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I have. Um, I've been to. Uh, there's a gentleman in Rhode Island, and he has set up. It's a concrete pad, which is 120 feet long by 60 feet wide, and there's um, there's decomposition buried in that concrete slab, and the dogs are able to hit on it even after 10 years. Wow, that's so, cool. Uh, concrete is porous, so you're going to have some odor come out. Is there anything that the dogs would have any limitations on detecting through? Um, I would imagine things like maybe metal, um, a, a metal um, barrel. However, dogs have been known to be able to sense humans that have been in metal barrels too. I, I really don't know, unless maybe something that's to do with the nuclear field, containing nuclear waste. It, you know, uh, you, anything that some of the plastics, if they're well, well sealed. I mean, you got to think about it. Most of the things that we use today, apart from plastic, is in some way porous. But if you've got a seam anywhere where you've put a lid on, you typically you can't get that 100% tight. And if there's just the slightest pinhole to let the scent out, eventually the dogs will hit on it. That's crazy. Uh, what are the ideal weather conditions for a search dog or a cadaver dog? What? <laughs> Nighttime. <laughs> oh, really? Night, yes, nighttime, sort of um, probably like 50 degrees, 60 degrees at night, uh, slight wind. Why is that? That's, why is that? Because the scent, the, when it's cold, the scent starts to drop. And um, a light wind will bring the scent to you, but it won't blow it all over everywhere. So it will create a really comfortable cone that if the dog hits, they can follow it back to the source. Okay. Now, what if there's a body in water that's a a pond or a lake and you can walk around the shore? Would the dog be able to detect a cadaver in water from the shore? Yes. No way. How does that work? (laughs) Same way. Same way. I mean, does the dog... Same way it does on land. All right, as you're decomposing, your gases come up, the wind takes it and blows it over. That's how, you know, and if you're if you're in a pond, typically a lot of times what happens is where on the shore that your dog's going to pick up the scent is definitely wind-driven rather than water-driven because in a pond, you're from the scent source, it kind of comes out in a circle. So, and as it comes to the surface, the wind will blow it one way or the other, and that's where you're going to pick up your odor. If it comes to a river, a lot of times what happens is that odor is um, in the stream itself. An example is I did a search on the Merrimack River several years ago, and my dogs picked picked up a little bit of him in one eddy on one side, but the vast majority of the scent was down the center of the river itself. They didn't pick anything up on the side because... He was in the center of the river and the flow of the river, because if you look at the flow, it changes from that center line. And then when it gets to the sides, it it moves at 90 degrees. So down the center of the river. So as long as the boat was in the center of the river, they were in odor. The minute you got to the left or the right, they came out of odor. And um, he was located. Again, it's going into odor. And then you hit a negative, it happens, it can happen on the water as well. Or you turn around and you come negative, 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 and then you hit the scent and the dog will instantly react. So you can search it either way. Okay, so if you're walking around the shore and and the dog catches that scent that's coming out, do you then get into like a small boat and paddle out to where the dog starts to have a, a more significant reaction? 
Yes, you can. Okay. All right. Okay. That's great to know. Uh, and something we should probably do um, at some point in the future. Yeah. I want to clear up one thing that I probably should have mentioned in the beginning, but our conversation got off to a, a great start and I lost my uh, opportunity. What is the difference between a search dog and a cadaver dog? There's no difference. A search dog looks for people. Yep. A live find dog, a live find search dog looks for people alive. A human remains or cadaver dog looks for people that are have passed. Now, certain agencies like FEMA, you 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 have a sing, what's called a single purpose dog. In other words, he will only search for live find or he will only search for cadaver. When you work a wilderness dog, you need to have the dog be able to search for both because I don't know when I'm called whether you're out in the woods and you're dead or alive, and I need to find you regardless. Whereas in a, in a USAR, in a disaster situation, you want to find the live people first. That's your priority. And then you can go back in with the cadaver dogs afterwards. So therefore, with things like FEMA and some of the state uh, USAR agencies, urban search and rescue agencies, the do- they're all search dogs. It's just some are specific for live find and some are specific for GABA and some are able to do both. That's a training thing, but they're all search dogs. That's great. Great okay. to know. And then, so what? what is Eisen and Angus? Angus is a live find tracking dog. So in other words, he's given a scent article and he tracks them like a police dog would. And then for air scenting, he's cadaver only. So when set free, he searches for cadaver. Um, My guy started out, we started out on a wilderness search and rescue team. So he, he does both. His commands are different for live find as they are cadaver. And in the, he's now seven years old. In the last five years, we've specialized in nothing but cadaver. Interesting. Uh, now, what about drugs? Do do they smell drugs at all, even though that's not their training? No. I'm not law enforcement. I'm a civilian volunteer. That's not that's not okay. part of my, what I do. I just wanted to know if you smelt that uh, bag I had on me uh, a few weeks ago. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I might have. He paid no attention. <laughs> no, I, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I guess I we well. There's some speculation that that closet was a drug, uh, like a grow closet. So I guess that was where my uh, my question came from. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that they wouldn't matter, I guess. Okay, so we went to this other location, which was the site that uh, came to us by interesting methods. I'm not going to get into it, but we had another location that we went to uh, on Sunday. And it, it was a, a, a burned down house and we knew that some dogs had perished in that fire and they were buried on the property. And we took eyes in there. And what happened when we were at that location? He didn't show any any signs of being interested in anything. As we came around to the front of the house, he showed he showed interest like he would in an animal not a human. So there is a difference in his body language. It's just curiosity more than this is what I'm trained to do. And this is the response my body's going to give when I find that odor. So I don't know if that was because of where the dogs had perished, but as far as the grounds itself, no, he showed no interest. He showed no interest in going in underneath. There was no, no human odor there that he showed any interest in. But he was somewhat curious about the the dead dogs. I don't know. He was curious. Something piqued his interest as he came around the front, closer to the road, but only in so far as you know, he kind of stretched out and kind of really gave it a really good sniff, then left it. Okay. I, again, a lot of a lot of what we do is being able to read our dog, body language of our dog, and what they show interest in. So as you're as you're training a search dog, it's not just Getting them to understand that this is what I'm hunting for and this is what I have great importance in if you could find it for me. But it's also understanding the body language of the dog as he goes through the world, what he shows interest in, what he doesn't show interest in, even on just a daily basis. You have to learn to read your dog. 
And there was a very brief moment inside the A-frame property uh, upstairs where Eisen kind of went to sniff in in a basket under the TV, and and you were like you were like uh, Eisen. And, uh, and he stopped and uh, resumed. But uh, we found out later that day that, uh, that that's where they keep their dog toys. So right. I, so that, that was kind of, I guess, the, a similar reaction that you gave to Eisen. Correct. And, that, and that's what you have to learn to do as a handler. I, you can't, he, he's not going to search in a bubble. I mean, there's all these other scents out there and you have to recognize the information that he's given you. And you concentrate your training on the hide and seek game is for this odor only. And this is what you get your super special reward for. Everything else is, yeah, you can still interest him, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Right. Because ultimately, he's still a dog. And dog toys would, would interest a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a computer here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, do you live with these dogs? These are your dogs? These are my dogs. I train them. I train other peoples to do this as well. And uh, he's my fourth search dog. So there was another location that we checked out, which was kind of surprising. And uh, Travis, you took us there with your trusty, uh, is it an explorer? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's an edge. Edge, yes. Your trusty edge. Uh, this is this hunting ground location. Tell us a little bit about what we found there. We didn't bring the dogs because we didn't have permission to do that yet. Right. We didn't bring the dog. We kind of found what almost looked like a campsite, more or less. Um, kind of a tarp strung up with some trees, a spot that looked like somebody had prepared to have a fire, um, a hatchet stuck in the tree among a bunch of other random debris that just seemed to have been thrown there. Odd objects, backpacks, things like that. Um, it's kind of a weird area to just have that there. Yeah, would would you would you say the impression that you got was that people were 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 squatting there, or would you say that this was a place where hunters would go and knew that they had a spot to start a fire or uh, prepare some some food or something? Um, I would almost say that it looked like it was probably some sort of a campsite for hunting or like kind of a hangout area, more or less for that purpose. Because there's not enough stuff there to say that somebody would likely be living there full time. It's just kind of a spot that they probably brought some stuff to, you know, that they thought they'd use during that day and left it there and okay. that sort of stuff. Okay. Okay. And again, I should have brought this up in the beginning, but we just had a nice flow. Travis, what, what do you do during professionally? Because you had a couple of uh, long days before that. You had a couple of long hikes before we went to, to, to New Hampshire. Could, Tell yeah, us a bit. so um, I work at what is actually a residential school for kids with disabilities, and uh, I am a crisis response staff. So I'm kind of the person that gets called in to assist when um, kids are having either a significant behavior or staff need assistance for one reason or another. Um, and the, the long hike that I had just taken before that was um, one of our clients had bolted into the woods, and we had to go help find him and his staff and bring them back. But yeah, that's what I do. And actually, very shortly, I'm moving into a position as a special education teacher at that school. Oh, very cool. cool. Nice. Congrats. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just want I just want people out there to know that we just we just don't pull people off the street here. <laughs> like we got some, <laughs> we got legit connections. Now, speaking of that property, just hypothetically, what if you were to walk a dog, the you know Eisen, past the property? Uh, and there is uh, uh, some human remains on the property, you know, uh, 50 yards away or whatever. How would Eisen react in that case? Well, there's a significant amount of scent. I mean, he's going to react to that. Okay. Absolutely. So, oh, interesting. Okay. So he would know even if we just brought brought him past. Interesting. Wow. So he'll want to go to that area. He'll start pulling you towards that area? Right. So what do you do legally in that case? Like, let's say just a hypothetical, we... We went to the this this area that had the uh, the what looked like a hunting camp site, and we walked Eisen on the on the public road, and he just showed this reaction that you're like he's got to go in there. What well, what is what is the next step legally for you, or do you just like undo his leash and just look the other way? Well, I suppose <laughs> you could do that too. Yeah, I suppose you could do that. I just can't go with him, you know. 
I mean, he's a dog. He's not a person. Right. So he can't pay a fine. Or you have to you have to inform law enforcement that that's what's going on and then get yourself permission. Well, it's always best to get permission. Yeah, of course. Okay. All right. That's good. Good to know. So what would our next steps be just having this information right now, in your opinions? Enjoy our Thanksgiving and wait till uh, spring? That's pretty much what you're going to have to do. You're looking for something that's 14 years old. Yeah, I mean, you know, come on. We've got snow. Yeah. And um, we've got ground cover. It's getting cold, so the scent's not going to come out um, if she is buried. The the other thing is, is you know what? Maybe we've maybe we've beat this to death, and maybe you need to look elsewhere. Elsewhere being other resources, or elsewhere physically, geographically. Geographically. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Now, um, I think my last question I have here is uh, about sort of a, a rumor that's been in the community forever, and, and it was about the A-frame property and about how the dogs went, quote-unquote, bonkers during one of the searches. Good call. So I guess in in your professional opinion, I mean, we don't even know what that means, really. We've we've talked about this ad nauseum. What does bonkers mean? That, that must mean there was a body there, and then to find out it turns out that dogs wouldn't, go bonkers they would lay down if there was a body so i guess correct what yeah what is, what does that mean to you <laughs> the dog goes bonkers that's not that's not the indication that they're trained to give when they hit the scent that they're looking for so that tells me that they're excited about something else if the dog's going bonkers because what they're trained to do in that situation would be to lie down in that area not freak out. <laughs> yeah. Right. To do the opposite of bonkers. Yeah. Correct. So, okay. So that's probably more on the training, uh, maybe. I, I guess it would be more on the training, but at the same time, that just tells me that there's probably something else that they're interested in, something else that excites them. Cause as we mentioned before, they're still dogs. So they're still going to be interested in other things. And potentially if the dog's not as well trained at that point, they're not going to be as diligent in searching for that one item. If they, come into something that distracts them. Man, it is so refreshing to hear professionals talk about this because <laughs> we've talked for dozens and dozens of episodes and we've said, oh, that's where the cadaver dogs went bonkers because we just, you hear that and you're like, well, they were, you know, they found something, they went bonkers. And it wasn't just there. We've heard other people that we haven't said, you know, on, on the show. We've heard other, other indications where dogs you had a reaction to a cadaver perhaps in the woods or something or you know oh well maybe over there it's just really refreshing to get a professional to say you know, just dismiss that bonkers thing because it's not legit Don't... well it's just questionable too it sounds like it, yeah it, it's hard to even pinpoint what it means so many years later so yeah well thank you very much uh, for joining us. And Lance, do you have any more questions? I think this has been great. I have no more questions and it was a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for delivering this information to us and to the listeners because they know that we went up there and they know that there's this movement to try to bring closure to this case. And anytime we do something using the resources that the community provides to us, we want to make sure that they know that we have legit people behind it. So this is awesome that you guys were able to find a really nice location to be together. Is that a Panera? Yeah, where are you? Uh, library. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, wait, wait, no talking in the library. <laughs> We've already been told off once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you.